Okay, sure. I think that Tom was going to open things. Is that right, Tom? Did you want to open things? Uh, well, yeah, I've been asked by Richard and a few of the folks just to say a few words on behalf of uh, Ash here in uh, New Jersey, our two sections. Uh, hello, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Tom DeChair. I'm Director of Environmental Engineering Services over at Aurora & Associates uh, based in Lawrenceville, New Jersey. And I currently have the privilege and honor of serving as president of the North Central New Jersey section of ASH. And on behalf of my board members and uh, all the board members of South Jersey section, uh, Amy Sikowski, president, who could not be here today, uh, we want to welcome you all to this uh, uh, student chapter conference. It, uh, based on the agenda and from what Richard and I and uh, Matt, Sandra, and Jim have been talking about, it seems like an exciting agenda. And um, I believe this is the second time that Mercer County may have uh, hosted uh, this conference. So I'd like to reach out to the folks at Mercer County and thank them also uh, for bringing the chapter here in New Jersey uh, and for uh, hosting this, uh, what I hope to be a very successful and very productive um, you know, conference. Uh, just for everyone and for some of the students who are listening in may not know, the general mission statement of ASH is that it's, uh, we're to provide a forum for members and partners of the highway industry to promote safe, efficient, and sustainable highway system through education, innovation, and fellowship. And we basically achieve our mission uh, through the gracious efforts of our professionals for, that come from almost every firm um, in the state of New Jersey and throughout the country. Uh, all leading engineering firms that are involved with the infrastructure of our state and our nation. And it's something that keeps our economy and the vitality of our nation secure. So we should all be proud of that. And a lot of the students that are here, hopefully you'll be joining the ranks of those individuals and uh, making our infrastructure even more resilient, more sustainable and stronger uh, for the future. Um, I personally like to thank Richard, one of my uh, also board members in the South and North, uh, for his efforts in putting this together. I know Richard will have a few words to say. Uh, Richard and I go back many years working on some very exciting projects throughout the state of New Jersey. And um, I'm just looking forward to seeing a lot of the students join ASH, become full members. Uh, we hope that you join and participate in our many meetings and presentations that we have, all of which are very informative and identify and discuss great projects in the New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, and Delaware area. Uh, it's, it's, it's a great forum where we network. It's a great forum where you meet some of the clients, some of the agency and authority directors and personnel. And it's just, um, it's, beyond this, it's beyond the books and the desk in the colleges where you actually get out and meet the people in the field. Uh, it's your chosen profession. It's a diverse profession and one that we hope uh, will get more, um, more students involved. And, uh, right now in North Central New Jersey and South, we have approximately 270 members, uh, 140 of which are in North Central Jersey. We're looking to expand that to 210 uh, by, the, uh, by Christmas time or by hopefully the winter. And we have 23 board members, all of which have individual responsibilities as chairperson. So you can see we're very active. And, and um, one of the interesting things, and I'll, I'll leave it at this, is that uh, with the virus has changed our industry, it's changed our way of thinking and our cha changed our way of doing business. Uh, this, this conference and the video platform that we're using is, um, is testament to that. Um, I got a feeling we're going to be doing this for at least another six to ten months, but one of the uh, benefits of video conferencing like this is we can get many more people involved, many more students involved, many more industry people involved, uh, where a lot of time travel is involved, conflicting schedules and even cost. Uh, having it online has allowed for a greater participation. Uh, we've seen that in our ASH meetings and uh, certainly by the numbers here on this conference, it's, it certainly has come true to form. So with that being said, I'd like to welcome you all. I hope you have a great conference. I think the agenda is terrific. I plan to listen in and hopefully learn as much as you will. And I'd like to turn it over to Richard uh, for a few comments on his behalf. But again, I thank you for this opportunity. I look forward to working with all of you. And if any of you out there have any questions about Ash and North Central, um, uh, what we do and our activities, and please feel free to email me. Um, that information can be easily given to you at the end of the conference. And if you have anything about career development, about our industry, please feel free to reach out to myself and to Amy. 
and to your uh, representatives from both the ASH sections and for those in nearby Delaware, Pennsylvania, New York. So anyway, good luck with your conference. Thank you again, and Richard, perhaps a few words. But I could have put money on it that I'd be shorter than you, uh, Tom, so I thought I will. Never happened, doesn't uh, happen. <laughs> um, so as chairperson of the ASH Southern New Jersey North Central Education Committee, a board member of ASH Southern New Jersey, I want to welcome everyone to this event. Although virtual, I think it's safe to say that this is the best attended of any ASH student conference. Uh, in attendance are at least 80 students, as uh, Matt said, from 16 different colleges and universities and a good number of professionals too. I would like to thank ASH at Mercer County for hosting this virtual conference. And it's the second year in a row that they have, they have, they have hosted a conference. The last one, of course, was live. Uh, that is so impressive considering that uh, Mercer County is the only community college in the ASH family. Uh, great credit goes to Mercer County students and Ashy Mercer County officers Bundy Sannon and Anita Rios for spearheading the effort. And as always, good old Professor Jim Macarella for encouraging his students to participate in the Ash student chapter. Can't say enough about that, Jim. I'm looking forward to this event and I would hope the representatives from those colleges that do not have Ash student chapters would seriously think about establishing one after seeing what can be done. In closing, I would like to put in a plug for Rowan, who will be hosting what looks like will be another virtual student chapter conference in the spring. So thank you very much. Uh, let's get going. So Anita and Bundy, did you have something to add or no? Um, yes. Um, Anita? Yes. As would you like to share the introduction? wanted to share this PowerPoint to start off with. Um, can everybody see it? Okay. Yes, I can see it. Yes? Yep. Okay. Um, my okay. name is Anita Rios and name, I am the... Oh, go ahead, Bundy. Uh, my name is Bundy Sanan. Um, I'm the president of ASH MCC student chapter. Um, and today's agenda, next screen, Anita. Okay, um, well, today's agenda is uh, the day in the life of a design engineer. Uh, a day in the life of a construction engineer. Why you should want to be a professional engineer. Um, how to transition from college to industry and how to form an ASH student chapter. Okay, um, our next speaker is Tom from North uh, Central. Tom? Well, I, I, I think uh, we're a little out of order, but I, I already made my uh, presentation and I think um, I don't know what else to add, but good luck. I think it's a great agenda. Let's move on with that. Uh, who's the next I think, speaker? I think Chris is, Chris is up next. Chris Scholey? Yep. Um, and before you start, Chris, because I know you're humble, if you don't mind, I, do, I just want to say a few words about you on your behalf. Sure. Um, so Chris used to be a Mercer student, and he was so good that he left us, went to Rutgers, earned his bachelor's degree, and then he earned his master's degree, and the poor guy can't get away from us. He's now helping us teach statics. And then I asked him to speak here. So it's, there's, once you meet me, there's, there's no getting away. So we really appreciate him being here. Thanks, Jim. Uh, it, it definitely speaks volumes to having a professor like Jim, uh, you know, at such a, you know, pivotal point in your academic career, it really helps, you know, set up that traje trajectory. Um, so thank you for the kind words. I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, hopefully you can all see it. Um, so I guess while that's loading, I just wanted to thank everybody that's involved in putting this, this conference together everybody at Mercer, um, everybody from ASH, you know, all the students for, for taking the time out to participate. Uh, a little bit about myself, like Jim said, I did attend Mercer County Community College and had the pleasure of being one of his students. Um, after Mercer, I went on to Rutgers to graduate with my master's and, and bachelor's from there. Since then, I've been working at WSP for about two years based out of their Lawrenceville office. I am a structural engineer um, I also, this was, this past summer was my first um, summer as a professor adjunct, and um, I am the president of the ASCE, Central New Jersey YMG, that stands for Younger Member Group, 
and also a member of the ASH Education Committee. So I work with Rich as well. So today I'm going to be presenting about being a design engineer and just a quick outline of what we're going to go over, some aspects of design, which include con concept development, rehabilitation, new design, and modeling. Uh, I'll also brief briefly discuss inspection and load rating and give you an, an insight on a sample project, which is Route 37 eastbound Mathis Bridge. Um, and then I'll you know, also briefly discuss work-life balance, and at that point I'll field any questions that people may have. So first things first, uh, the disciplines of civil engineering, the, the main ones are structural, uh, water resources and hydraulics, geotechnical, environmental, and transportation engineering. Uh, like I said, I'm a structural engineer, um, but I feel it's important to discuss all of them at some point because in your careers, you're, you're never going to be exclusively doing your specific engineer. Uh, you know, these projects are multidisciplinary and you're you're gonna work with other disciplines of civil engineering um, the topic or the focus of today's presentation will be structural engineering as that's what I do so one aspect of design is concept development this is usually the first phase of a project where you're working with the client to assess feasibility of new concepts uh, you work to develop the best alternatives and work to inform the public and gain their support most highway projects are publicly funded, so it's, you know, getting the public's support is a big issue. And if you, if on the flip side of it, if you don't have their support, that can become a big obstacle. Um, this is a very high level design at this stage. There aren't very much details or calculations going on. It's just seeing what, what will work. And, um, you know, if you have a problem, how are you going to address it? Another aspect of design is rehabilitation or rehab for short. Uh, rehabbing is always done for existing structures. If you're rehabbing a new structure, you've done something wrong. Um, typically you rehab for two reasons. One is that the structure is deteriorated from typical wear. Um, another reason is that it, it doesn't meet, it's older and it doesn't meet the current design standards. So most of the US infrastructure was built between the 50s and 60s. Um, with a 50 to 75 year design life. Uh, you know, throughout their life, deterioration has happened, whether in, you know, some of the causes may be de-icing salts that corrode the steel, um, changes in loading and design loads and extreme events, um, all of which contribute to the need for rehab. Another aspect on the flip side of design is a new design. Uh, sometimes when a, a structure is too far gone, um, it needs to be completely designed or you, you need a completely new structure so it becomes a new design. Um, another case might be, is, you know, there's nothing there at that time and you need to put a highway or a bridge to cr construct a new road. Um, the same steps are taken. You need to determine like dead and live loads. Also extreme events you need to consider. So one of the aspects of design are, is typically structural modeling. Um, when you're modeling a structure, you will put it together in a geometric uh, 3D CAD model. Um, at that point, you can upload it to an engineering software, and there's many of them out there. And you'll use that engineering software to analyze the structure um, and determine its structural response to various load cases. This can be wind loading, uh, earthquakes, or just to evaluate different kinds of trucks on, on the structure. Um, one of the cool things about structural software is it's very easy to make changes. It's You can input section properties to see if you want to look at different kinds of beams, uh, different materials, whether they're steel or FRP or concrete. Um, one thing to really know about modeling is it's not the end all be all. The way we use it is to verify our calculations. So as engineers, we have to go through a good amount of schooling uh, and that doesn't go out the window as soon as you encounter a structural model. Uh, you, you, the way you approach this is you, you have an idea of how the structure is supposed to behave. You'll do some back of the hand calculations 
and you'll model the structure and in, you want the model to verify what you would expect to see. One of the emerging uh, technologies with structural modeling is uh, the combination of the structural model with plan development. So essentially you create the entire structure in the model and then you can take a cut of it within the model and use it to generate a plan. Plan as engineers are almost entirely what we do. Uh, in the past, they haven't really been a married, two married concepts. Uh, they've been pretty exclusive. And this, you know, on the engineering side, uh, budget side, this would this is a great thing that um, an emerging technology that would save a lot of money and uh, a lot of time on projects. Another thing that's not always classified under design is inspection and load rating. Um, some companies have staff do both and some people have a staff that exclusively do inspections and load ratings. However, I feel it's important to discuss it because it kind of completes the cycle of design. Uh, you can access bridges from different ways. Uh, you can see on the top left picture, a bucket truck and on the bottom left picture, a person accessing the uh, site by boat. What you do when you're inspecting bridges, you want to see the deterioration. So in the top right image, you can see a concrete beam that's uh, steel, it has steel inside of it. So it's concrete encased. The steel corroded and the concrete encasement popped out. Um, so you can see that there is signs of deterioration here. When I say completes the cycle of design, um, I mean bridges need to be inspected at a minimum every two years. So the owner of a bridge, if you go out and inspect the structure and see that there is severe deterioration, you would load rate it, which basically means you're analyzing its capacity as it is now versus how it was originally designed. So if there's significant deterioration, your beam might have only 20% capacity of what it was designed for. In addition to that, the trucks that it was designed for are significantly lighter than the trucks that are on the road today. So you know, given those parameters, you can go back to the owner of the bridge, say this bridge, it's not in great shape. Um, we're recommending you to either replace it or rehab it. And then you go back to the concept development or you go through design rehab or complete design. Another thing you might do as a design engineer is inspecting unique structures such as tunnels or movable bridges. In the top left image, you have a tunnel in the bottom left and top right images, you have movable bridges. The image shown in the bottom left is a lift bridge. So that whole center span actually lifts up. Whereas on the top right, that's a bascule bridge. So it, the, that portion, the movable portion of the bridge kind of rotates. Um, you can also do inspections of unique structures like sign structures. Uh, and, and a lot of structures are only accessible let me rephrase, some structures are only accessible by suspension cables. Uh, so as you can see from the bottom right picture, it looks like he's inspecting a sign structure. These unique structures, uh, they require a deeper understanding and they require work with different disciplines. For example, mechanical or tunnels, uh, sorry, uh, movable bridges or tunnels, they will require collaboration with geotechnical electrical and mechanical engineers, as well as the structural engineers. So I'll briefly talk about a sample project, which is Route 37 eastbound Mathis Bridge. It was a rehab and improvement. This bridge connects Tom's River and Seaside Heights over Barnegat Bay. And much like most of New Jersey, it was devastated by Superstorm Sandy in 2012. It is a movable bridge, it has a dual leaf bascule which similar to what we just saw, it's, it's a bridge that moves about a point. It doesn't lift vertically. Uh, the, the main scope of this project was the deck replacement. Um, it, we used precast exodermic deck as shown in the bottom image. What that means is this is a type of deck that was completely done off site and then kind of just brought in and dropped in place. Uh, that allowed for rapid construction and another key feature of this was because of the marine traffic, because uh, of Barnegat Bay, there was a lot of ships and barges that travel through. 
and also the highly traveled highways um, going to the shore during New Jersey summer, construction had to be outside of peak season. So essentially had to be in the winter and fall. There's issues when you're pouring concrete, you, you need a very, uh, you need certain environmental conditions for it to work well, such as warm weather, no rain, and a bunch of other things. So construction in the cold wasn't much of an option. So we used these precast deck panels. And like I said, we came in and kind of dropped them into place and we can ensure there is more quality assurance to make sure that they're the right strength. A unique phase of this project was the barrier gate crash testing and modeling. So the, a barrier gate is something that we'll put right in front of the movable portion of the bridge to prevent cars from crashing into the bridge when it's in the open position. So you need to be compliant with certain government entities or agencies. Um, the compliance for barriers is MASH. So uh, for this barrier, we needed to be MASH TL2 criteria compliant. And that includes a small vehicle and a pickup truck crashing into the barrier at 44 miles per hour head on or 90 degrees at a quarter and a half span impact points. So first thing we did was we modeled it. We did some designs. And then we did a finite element modeling analysis and simulations. So here you could see we have a pickup truck and it's colliding at 44 miles per hour on a head on collision at quarter span. And again, the goal of this crash barrier is to prevent the, the truck from, you know, passing through the barrier and essentially to contain it safely. And as you can see from the simulation, it does just that. We also did a physical and actual crash testing and you know, that verified our results. We did the same thing here with the passenger car. And again, the model showed that it would be contained safely and the physical test did just that. So we'll take a look now at the physical test And you can see it's still a very violent collision. But again, the goal of the barrier is to safely contain the passengers or the passenger vehicles. And it does just that. And you can see what's unique here. I mean, something like this is not, this isn't an everyday task for a design engineer. Um, so it was cool to, to verify something with a real life barrier crash testing. It's not, it's very expensive. It's not something you do very often. So now I'll discuss a little bit about work-life balance. Work should not always be strictly about work. Professional societies are a great way to engage with your coworkers or other people in the industry. Um, it's excellent for your career development both personally and professionally. And many companies will sponsor your involvement by paying your membership dues. A lot of our companies also have company sponsored sports and events. WSP in particular, we have uh, softball and volleyball teams, among other things. Um, there's, they also encourage you know, uh, philanthropy and community service, Habitats for Humanity, Engineers Without Borders, and continuing education, such as attending conferences, doing field trips and site visits. And a lot of companies will offer tuition reimbursement if you were to go back to school and get more degrees. Again, this is crucial. It, it really helps you build your career, um, not just for learning about new things. For example, the bottom right picture is a site visit that I took to um, High Steel, who's a steel fabricator, a major steel fabricator on the East Coast. And I learned a lot about how steel is actually, you know, put together and then used on a bridge that I would have designed. So it's, it's great for your career development and it's also great for your ne networking and strongly encourage. And as you are all at this conference now, you're ahead of the game. So at that point, I'll stop here and I'll take a couple of minutes to answer any questions you might have. Uh, again, I wanted to thank you all for attending today. Uh, thank you for everyone who put this together.
And I thank you, Chris, for doing your part and um, helping more students to become what you have become. I wanted to make a comment though. Um, I have a fear of bridges so bad. And to know that I have you know, now more in-depth uh, knowledge of how the bridges are built, I feel a little bit more safe. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Hey, Chris, you have a question in the chat pod. Um, uh, Roger asked, what is your perspective on a designer getting to go out in the field to see what they've designed? Students may want to know if that is a possibility once they get into the office environment after graduating. It, it definitely is. Um, a lot of times you'll go out there and, and see the project after it's completed or you'll go out there periodically during construction. Um, there are people who do stay out there during construction to make sure that it's, you know, going according to plan uh, per se. Um, another thing that I found very helpful was as a junior engineer going out and doing inspections. Um, when you're designing something, you know, it's usually, it's, it's a model or it's a spreadsheet or it's, it's handwork. Um, especially you're, you're going to encounter new things every day. Uh, going out into the field as an inspector and seeing these things that you, you typically see on paper, it really helps your understanding of how things come together in real life. Any other questions for him, Matt, or is that it? No more questions in the chat pod. Okay, great. Oh, I'm okay, Matt. Can I make Sorry. one comment, Chris? I just want to say to Chris that um, you know he's he's one of the most active members of the Ash Education Committee too, and I really appreciate all his help. He's one of the few people that actually gets back to me when I send out emails quickly. So, um, so I echo what Professor Macarella said about Chris. I think he's 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 a great asset to Ash and the Education Committee, and I thank I thank him for his presentation too. I thought it was really good. Thank you, guys. Yeah, Chris, uh, Tom here. I just wanted to add one thing too for your presentation that a lot of times in the design and um, has to go out to the community, local stakeholder groups, an engineer, uh, whatever capacity may be on the project has an opportunity to meet the citizens and the local stakeholders that are gonna be directly affected by the project and that gets you out into the community. And uh, that gives you a lot of feedback from the community how to design or a roadway and interchange or a bridge. Uh, so that's an opportunity as well. And there's a lot of input that that's provided into the decision-making. Absolutely. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Rich. Well, with that, I'll pass it over to the next presenter, Jared, who's going to be discussing a day in the life of a construction engineer. And I'm going to jump in again, if you don't mind, to say things about Jared, because again, he's humble. Um, Jared was a student of mine at Rowan years and years ago, because I'm old. And he was so good, we recruited him to work for us at, at Urban, which he did. And he also, the poor guy, is teaching for us at Mercer. So let that be a lesson to you. You meet me, I'm gonna have you wind up teaching at Mercer at some point, but Jared's fantastic. Thank you, thanks Jim. Let me see if I can figure out how to share my screen here and then I'll get started. All right, can we see my screen? Awesome. Uh, and Chris, uh, again, that was an awesome presentation. Um, you know, that was very informative. And, uh, and Jim, thanks for the invitation to present here tonight. And, and thanks everyone for, for joining on a Friday afternoon. I'll try to make this as exciting as possible. Um, so uh, the topic I'm going to speak to is a day in the life of a construction engineer. So uh, before I get into that, just briefly, let me see, make sure I can change here. Okay, great. So as you mentioned, uh, my name is Jared Krause. I, I am the general manager of our facilities construction services at Urban Engineers. I've been with Urban for 12 plus years. And prior to that, I worked for a few other local engineering firms. And my background is in both design and construction of, um, I started off my career in highway bridge and then um, made a career shift into vertical structures. 
Uh, as I mentioned, I also teach at Mercer County Community College, where I've been teaching for, I think, about five years now. I've taught both fluid mechanics and survey. Um, also add that I am a, a Rowan, engineer, uh, Rowan uh, University graduate, where I received a uh, bachelor's in civil engineering and then pursued my uh, master's degree. So what is a construction engineer? So after Chris is, is done with the design, um, although he still may be involved with the construction in terms of administrative perspective, the project is then typically handed off to some type of um, construction engineer, construction representative or manager. So we'll use that term construction engineer kind of loosely. But essentially what that individual is, is um, it's an on, it's an on-site representative that is there to monitor the work. There's somebody that helps get the job done. They are some, but not just get the job done, right? When we we're building a project, whether it's a highway, a bridge, a building, we wanna make sure that the job gets completed, but we wanna make sure it's a quality product. And also importantly, we wanna make sure that it's completed on time and within budget. This individual also serves as a go-between between ownership and the contractor and design team. So I think this is a, a, an interesting graphic, just showing all of the potential parties involved with a, a design and construction project. And when, when I say owner's rep or project manager, we're referring to on the construction side, um, an individual that is um, representing the owner but you'll see all of the arrows leading in multiple directions. So they're juggling all of these different stakeholders and parties. So you have off to the right-hand side, you have various different stakeholders, public meetings, um, zoning, permitting, you have the design team, architect or engineer. And then off to the left, you have the various um, construction trades, both on the, the general contractor as well as individual um, trades and you know this is um, very generic but it shows that we're that go-between we're the interface for the facilitator to get the job done hey, hey Jared, I'm, Jared, I'm, Jared let me interrupt you for I'm um, sorry you're uh, I think you you've gone into slideshow mode but you're still sharing your your other yeah. view so you might want to close your share and open it up on your uh, slideshow that you've opened you're not advancing let me see now I've thrown off your 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 sorry, whole story. sorry about, <laughs> sorry about <laughs> that. let's see yeah you may have to close stop sharing and reshare and grab the right one is it uh is it working now yeah that looks that looks right okay yeah hopefully you saw this stuff but if not it's okay <laughs> we uh, didn't but I think you're caught up okay great Sorry about that. All right, so jumping back into it here. Uh, so what are some of the roles of a construction engineer? So we can play, there are various different roles that we may play as a construction representative. So we can be a construction manager. Construction manager is, is again, a, a facilitator, someone that's managing the overall construction process. Once the design is complete, um, they're the individual in the field managing all of the interface between monitoring work activities to processing contractor payments to reviewing submissions then we could be a construction inspector construction inspector would be someone in the field um, observing the work inspecting the installation of, of work activities to verify conformance with the plans and specs we could also serve as a quality assurance or quality control inspector so there are quality control inspectors that are performing various testing of materials on site. That could be um, concrete testing, soils testing, non-destructive testing of welded, of welded elements. And then we have a quality insurance inspector, which could be an overarching inspector that's making sure that the quality control inspector is doing what they're supposed to do. Someone that's on a high level overseeing the quality of the project. And then lastly, a uh, special inspector, which is an individual, depending on the municipality or, or local agency, 
that may be mandated by code um, to have an engineer on site retained by the owner to perform engineering level inspections of the contractor's work to verify compliance with the plans, specs, and uh, uh, pertinent building codes or construction codes. Some of the uh, duties and responsibilities that, that I have and, and that other construction professionals uh, may have when we are in the field um, is to monitor work activities for compliance with the construction documents. So what that means is we're out in the field every day verifying that the work that the contractor is doing is done in accordance with the plans, specifications, and codes. We also may be required to review the contractor's schedule and budget. So the contractor establishes a baseline schedule. They, they'll say, okay, we can build this, this bridge in one year. Well, each month and really each day, we're monitoring what the contractor's progress is and, and making sure that they're on track to complete the particular milestones of the project and ultimately deliver the, the project within the allotted period of time. We're also checking budgets, reviewing payment requisitions for contractors, making sure that if the contractor, if this month, if the contractor claims to have completed $200,000 worth of work, we're out there to, to verify that the contractor did in fact complete $200,000 worth of work. Um, this can become contentious at times because, you know, this could potentially um, prevent the contractor from getting paid what he thinks he's owed. So there's a lot of negotiation and back and forth. Um, in addition, you have things um, called change orders or extras that could come up where we are the negotiator of those requests for contractor payments. Uh, we as construction professionals are, we're holding various meetings, um, reporting back to the owner on work progress, on any potential issues, um, submittal statuses. We also help to resolve both, now we're not the, as a construction representative, we're not the design professional or the engineer or architect of record, but we are there to help resolve design or constructability issues. Um, you know, I, I can say this because I was a designer. Um, no design is perfect. No set of plans are perfect. And when the contractor, all of the mistakes usually start to show once you try to build whatever it was shown on the documents. So when you start to, to construct whatever it is, a highway, a bridge, a building, invariably issues come up. And in, in the field, we help resolve those issues. Uh, we also help monitor worksite safety. So we, we are OSHA trained and OSHA 10 or OSHA 30, and we help enforce the contractor's um, worker safety plans and help maintain, we're not ultimately responsible, but help to monitor and make sure that the work site is safe. And then lastly, a big part of our job is coordination with various stakeholders, whether that be um, community members, um, public agencies, private businesses that could be impacted by the proposed work. So um, no, no rhyme or reason to some of these. These are just some, some key things that I jotted down here, no particular order. But I think um, you know, these are just some of the key attributes I think are really important for really for anybody, but particularly for our field staff, for myself, um, things that we look for in, in our construction folks. So, you know, I just want to touch on some of these, you know, team management, you know, we, you know, everybody is different, right? People are different, but we need people to work together in order to deliver project. If everybody's butting heads all the time, if you're not a leader, uh, you're never going to get the job done. Communication, you know, I, a lot of construction mistakes come down to poor communication. You know, a great example, you know, we observe an issue in the field and we're the eyes and ears. We're in the field every day. So we need to report back to the applicable people, whether that be the design professional, the owner, um, about what the issues we're seeing and work to a speedy resolution. So if we can't communicate clearly, both verbally and in written form, you know, we're, we're you know, we're not going to be very successful because, um, 
the work will the work will continue. The contractor is going to keep moving, and we need to work to that speedy resolution. Technical competency. This really goes without saying. We're out there to observe the work, but also to make sure that the work is compliant. So we need to have a technical understanding of what the contractor is doing in order to really observe and and verify that their work is done properly. Organizational skills. I mean, this goes without saying, but everything that happens in the field is documented down to every piece of equipment on site to the man hours you know being utilized on site to the quantities of work installed so you need to have strong organizational skills to document the work uh, for record keeping purposes but also um, you know, to, to verify payments or, or to resolve issues later on in the job attention to detail Again, this is this really go, applies to all aspects of engineering. Engineers need to have a strong and good attention to detail. We're reviewing contract documents. We're observing the work in the field, and you know we could sometimes we're looking at things to you know the thousands of an inch. Sometimes it's big picture stuff, but regardless, you know we need to have a strong attention to detail. Negotiation skills. You know we're we're a representative of the owner. And in doing that, you know, we have to, we're the go-between. So I talked about change orders before. We have to negotiate. The contractor may think he's owed $100,000. And I may think he's owed $50,000. So that creates contention. And we need to have a good demeanor to be able to negotiate, you know, that change order, figure out what's fair for both parties. Problem solvers, right? That's, as engineers, we're problem solvers. You know, in the field, we're working with the design team and the contractors to help keep the job moving and, and solve any problems we may face. Foresight, um, you know, this is super important. I, you know, I learned this uh, my first day in the field. You know, you need to always be thinking multiple steps ahead. You know, there, you have to plan for things going wrong. If the contractor is installing, um, you know, one element of work in one location, you can't just be fixated on that particular element of work. You have to start thinking about, well, what is he gonna do next? And what is he gonna do right after that? You know, you're thinking multiple steps ahead to anticipate potential problems. You know, emotional intelligence, we don't really think much about emotions, but it, it is super important. Um, have strong people skills, even reading others, others' emotions, particularly in the field. It, it's, you know, I've, again, I've worked in, in both settings in the, design, in the office as a designer, as well as in the field. And, you know, particularly with contractors, you know, the emotions get heated, the conversations are heated, the language that's thrown out is, is rough. And, you know, a CM really needs to understand human emotions and, and, and be able to diffuse situations. And that, that really goes with mediation as well in, uh, you know, being kind of a peer mediator, you know, we're not hired to do that, but that's really part of the job to stay calm and, you know, and again, to diffuse situations. Because they, they always come up and that, that's probably one of the, the key takeaways in, in the field. Because unlike as a design professional, usually we get more time to think things through. We can, you know, we're behind a, a desk, we're carefully thinking out an email. You know, in the field, we're a situation, you know, the contractor's in your face. You know, they're six inches away from you, yelling and screaming that they need an answer, they need something fixed. Um, and, and you can't hide behind a computer. So that's really tough. And then lastly, you know, enthusiasm. You know, you, you need to have a good attitude. I mean, this applies to you know design and construction. You need to go into work every day with a good attitude. And people need to like you. And I think that's the main thing. You need to build relationships. If if you go out there, even if you're technically always right, if the contractor or someone on the team doesn't like you, you're not going to get the job done. Um, so um, that's super important and you'll see here a nice graphic it's a, i can't see it on my screen here because it's blocked uh, but there's a nice graphic over here it just represents you know that can that construction personnel in the middle there controlling time cost scope quality and just some of the things that you know may be in their mind and that, what they're responsible for all right so uh this is a a couple of pictures I put together here from a recent job, not the one on the top left, right? The one on the top left with the flowers, that's uh, 
you know, a nice, clean office. Um, you know, no offense to, uh, to Chris and the design professionals, but uh, you know that that's not where we're sitting as a as a construction professional. We're in the, our office space varies from job to job, but it may look a little bit more like what you see in the bottom right corner, which would be your typical field office. Sometimes it's in a trailer, sometimes it's it's in your pickup truck or in the back of your Nissan. You know that that's your office, and um, it, it's got a lot of pros and a lot of cons. And uh, off to the bottom left there, that's a picture I was out on the job yesterday, and these were that's an example of a wash station. You know where you go in, you wash your hand. That's that's from a job. I took that picture yesterday. Um, so, you know, that that's the, you know, so it's not for everyone, but um, it, it is, I, I think it's a, it's a great, uh, it's a great path and a great experience, even if you don't choose it as your ultimate profession. So here are some, um, some photos that these are our projects that I've been on or I've taken these photos. Um, just wanted to kind of share some, some stories here um, about what our, our work office looks like, right? We're not, you know, I don't report to an office um, in terms of generally speaking, and sometimes I do, but you know, I'm in the field a lot. So this is what my office looks like. And in the left-hand side there, this was a project that we completed in uh, Battery Park City. Um, that's a, the, the lower part of Manhattan in New York. And uh, I was working on this barge, working um, days and nights, seven days a week. Um, we were doing a power mediation contract where we were jacketing piles that were deteriorated in the, in the water. And we were working from the bar, that's where we performed all the work. There were divers and it was a very interesting job. And my, I don't know if you can, if this presentation shows my mouse or not, but there's a Connex box, a little box on top of this barge here that I'm kind of swirling with my, I don't know if you can see it or not, but that was our office. So our office was on this barge and inside of one of these boxes there, there were, um, you know, desks and chairs set up and computers, and, and that's where we did our work. Uh, in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see, uh, this is a picture at the Empire State Building. So we were a construction representative working on the Empire State Building. Um, you know, I was personally involved, personally up there. We're, you know, 14, 1,500 feet up in the air. So if you're afraid of heights, that's not for you. Uh, but it was really, really cool project to be a part of. Um, and you know that was our our work setup. So you know we're not doing the physical work, but we are observing the work. So we need access to all the places that the contractor is working. The lower right hand corner. This was a project in Long Island City, also in New York. Um, you can see it's pretty dirty, right? It's messy. We're here. We're installing uh, micropiles into the ground to support um, a new structure. So it's, it's a messy job. You're standing in there. You have to be, there's a pile rig right there. You have to, you're within a few feet of it. So you're standing in the mud, you're standing in the water, you're getting dirty. So this is, uh, here's a couple of pictures on the left featuring myself and um, uh, you know, Dr. Macarelli, you may, you may not recognize these exact photos, but you've been personally on some of these sites. The upper left-hand corner is a, is a site in Ashtabula, Ohio. And um, this that's me inside of a coal silo performing um, some condition inspections. So that is coal that I'm standing on, tied off with the lifeline there. And uh, it was a very interesting project. And the bottom left-hand corner, uh, that's me again uh, with a hammer there. I'm um, banging on the web of a steel beam that's been completely ero corroded through but due to the coal and sulfuric acid uh, sitting there on top of the beam flanges. So as you can see, you know, we're getting pretty dirty there. And that, that was some, uh, some nasty stuff. That coal, even we're wearing Tyvek suits and I don't know why my respirator's not on there, but uh, it should be. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that stuff, it, it, that, it gets on your, goes in right through everything, right onto your skin. And um, the Upper right hand corner here, this is a recently completed project in um, the Upper East Side in, in Manhattan. And you can see again, if you're afraid of heights, this isn't for you. What you'll see there is a, um, in the orange, that's steel, that's a tower crane. So we're erecting a tower crane 
and you'll see that uh, there's a, a tie that you see that there's an iron worker leaning over the edge. He is tied off. He's leaning over and he's connecting the tower crane brace back to the primary structure. So this is the type of this is the type of work that you know I'm involved with on an everyday basis. Again, not performing the work, but observing the work primarily for conformance to the documents, but also facilitating and making sure that this job gets done on time, within budget, and it's done right. So I'm not sure how I'm doing on time because I'm not, not timing myself here. Hopefully I'm, I'm doing okay. But um, I want to end with, a, um, with an example here. Um, this will be a, this is a typical example. This is this, uh, something that uh, recently ran into, and you could imagine if if you you are a a recent grad, maybe you, you get a job, your first engineering uh, company, and you're assigned into the field, and you're performing a role as some type of construction inspector or construction engineer or representative on site. You're observing the work, and you come across the contractors doing some excavation. And what you see on the left-hand side, this is, there's a column sitting on top of a pile cap. Beneath that are the pile foundations. So the pile foundations are deep foundations that go 100 foot down into the ground and, and they're socketed into bedrock. And you're on site and you discover, um, you can see one of these piles here, and you'll see it more clearly on the right-hand side, is completely severed. So that's not good, right? We don't need to really even be an engineer to know that. We can see that that pile is completely severed, meaning that all that axial load coming down from the column into the pile cap, where's it going, right? It's a good question. It's completely severed. So this is, this is a real job. Um, you know, I won't tell you which job, but it is a real job. We discovered this issue. I was personally there, I took these photos. And you know, this is a, is a great example of what you may be tasked with or faced with you discover this issue and you need to know what to do. And they don't really teach you that in, you know, in engineering school. I remember my first, uh, you know, I was working for an engineering firm doing design for about four or five years before I really had my first full-time field assignment. And it was a rude awakening because, you know, it wasn't anything that I was prepared for. School didn't prepare me for it. Um, doing my you know, design work didn't prepare me for it. I technically kind of knew what I was doing, but you had to think on the fly, think very quickly, and um, there are challenges. And in this case, um, you know, think about what you would do if you were in the field. So, you know, you don't, I mean, this, this could be at risk for an eminent collapse, or maybe it's been like this for 50 years. You know, we don't know, um, but you're changing the loading as you're excavating, you're and the only thing. So this is a, a big risk. So, you know, obviously one of the things we first want to do is communicate and you know, we communicate this issue back to the site representative from the contractor, the site superintendent, the foreman, the contractor's project manager, document, take photographs, write up a report, don't waste time. You can't sit on this for two weeks, you know, send, send these photographic evidence and your report and sketches immediately back to the design team, copying the owners and everybody involved so that nobody can, can could claim that they didn't know about it. And also you want to make sure that you're not holding up the contractor with this issue either. So, um, you know, I think this is a, one of those really good examples of, of something that highlights some of the things we face. Um, you know, some other examples are, um, you know, really um, just uh, disputes. I mean, I spend most of my, most of my day, right? The topic of this is the day in the life of, of a construction engineer. And most of my day is spent Putting out, putting out fires, solving problems, and dealing with um, personnel issues. And when I say personnel issues, it's not necessarily, you know, dealing with my staff or or employees of ours. It's dealing it's dealing with disputes between inspectors and field staff and the contractor, or the contractor and the sub consultant, um, you know, or the subcontractor doing the work. So that is. Um, you know, not necessarily something that I ever thought I would be doing, um, but I, it is very, um, you know, it is very rewarding and very satisfying. I think someone asked a question about, do you, as an engineer, do you get to see the work being built? And, um, you know, th that's probably what I love most about 
um, being a construction manager is really being able to have a set of plans and in real time watch the structure get built and help solve the problems. As a, as a designer, you know, I was off, off, often frustrated because, you know, I would um, work on a concept development study or, you know, prepare some, or even do final plans and then it would never get built or maybe it got built 15 years later, you know? So it, it's really awesome to, uh, to get to see things actually um, being built in real time and helping solve all those problems. And uh, with that, I will, um, and I don't know if, if you want me to do questions now or wait to the end. Okay. So um, yeah, I'll open it up to any questions. Jared, there's a question in the chat box from Roger. Uh, says, what do you feel is the biggest factor that contributes to schedule delays and budget impacts on a construction project? Uh, unclear big construction documents, poor communication, contractor owner procedures, habits. We've always done it this way, that kind of thing. Um, just any thoughts you have on that? Yeah, well, you just hit them all. <laughs> yeah, th those, are all, those are all things. I mean, right now it's, um, you know, in, with COVID, I mean, COVID is a huge um, problem right now in construction. I mean, we, you know, a lot of things have stopped, but a lot of our projects haven't, haven't, um, haven't stopped at all due to COVID and we're actively working on construction projects that haven't stopped. But um, so what we're dealing with right now is very relevant is um, slower productivity. So just due to all the protocols, the cleaning, the spacing. So we have decreased um, productivity of the workforce. Also, delays of in procurements, long lead items, I and mean, things are just are more difficult to get your hands on right now. I mean, that's something specific to COVID. But um, yeah, in general, um, you know, schedule delays are you know come from a multitude of reasons. You touched on a lot of them. It could be um, it could be unclear or incomplete contract documents. It could be unqualified workforce. It, you know, it could be um, um, discovering um, uh, different field conditions. You know, a lot of times, you know, we try our best as a designer and I've been there as a designer and we, we design for everything and then you open something up and all of a sudden, oh wait, I thought there were piles under there or I thought, you know, whatever. And then just like the example I showed with, the, with that pile cap, that all of a sudden delayed the job. Well, that designer had no idea that that was gonna be the case. That may have delayed the job for 30 days because there's not an instant fix. Now we have to go back to the drawing board. The engineer has to, re to work out a solution and hopefully you have enough float in your schedule and the, and the contractor can move on to a different work activity. And that's not hopefully on your critical path. Uh, another, another question uh, from Anita, any suggestions on how to not fear heights? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Uh, no great suggestions, but I have faced that. I've had, you know, I, that's not a question I ask when I hire people. Um, but I realized that I probably should because I had an inspector at one point in time that was a, a steel inspector and he was afraid of heights. <laughs> so I'm not sure if that's considered discrimination or not, but, uh, you know, it is a pre it really is a prerequisite for certain things, not for every field. Um, I would suggest sticking to, um, um, probably something that uh, is not elevated. So um, maybe just stick to, don't do bridges, maybe just stick to roads. <laughs> hey, I have a question. I, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Okay, so, um, so being at your job sometimes requires you to go into like a, a coal silo, um, for example. Um, and I can't imagine you can do that forever. Um, where do you think uh, your, um, the work, or like your work experience will take you in the future? Yeah, great, great question. Um, so yeah, so you can evolve. I mean, I started off the presentation with some of the different roles that you can be in as a, as a construction professional. So typically, you know, people will start out a little bit, you know, lower on the totem pole, right? You're doing, you're, you're doing the, the tough labor intensive work, right? You're crawling around in, you know, in a coal silo or, you know, you're doing a, a, a bridge painting job and you're crawling around between, you know, the work platform and the underside of the bridge. You only have a couple foot clearance and it's killing your back and your knees. Um, you, you always put your time in 
and you have to learn, you have to be experienced in various roles as a construction inspector, an office engineer, you know, um, a resident engineer, you work your way up and you do different things, but there's a great um, career path for those in the construction industry that doesn't involve you spending every day out in the field or every day doing the labor intensive work where you're doing more management and oversight. So you're not necessarily um, being as exposed as like you saw me in the coal silo there. Sure, to get another question, and I will butcher the name, so I won't say it, uh, but uh, did you get extra construction management training uh, or did you learn it uh, as you worked as an engineer? So, um, good question. You know, my educational background was uh, you know, civil engineering as, a, as an undergrad and then um, engineering management as a master's. Um, so I did not, at the time I was in school, I didn't pursue construction management in the formal um, setting in school um, because at the time I didn't know that that was what I was gonna gravitate to. So I think that the key takeaway there before I answer your question is, is um, my philosophy and approach has always been um, really take any opportunity that came my way and it kind of just my career progressed in this path. So I would encourage all those to do the same unless you know this is the only thing I like and then I do it really well and you want to be a specialist. But um, So in terms of getting the formal education on in construction management, um, for me, it, it was um, trial by fire. You know, I was thrown into it and I thrived. You know, it was sink or swim and I swam. And I think that, um, you know, and then since then, you know, I've, I've pursued various different certifications and other things. Um, to more formalize the education in it, but um, but yeah, I mean, my first day it was uh, I was like I said I was thrown to the wolves, and um, you know that's not ideal. You know, you want to be a little better prepared, but you know, everything's not perfect. That's all the questions in the chat pod. If you guys want to move on to the next one, we're, we're probably running just a little bit behind, but I know you got a little bit of slop in the schedule, so you're probably doing pretty good. Great. Well, uh, yeah, thanks for the questions and, and thanks for letting me present. And uh, I'll pass it off to Dr. McGrill. And I should stop sharing my screen here. Yeah. Thanks, Jared. So while I get my... Uh slides up here. I want to first of all comment, Jared mentioned emotional intelligence. I never even knew there was such a thing. Um, as an Italian, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't be very good at that. But uh, Jared is perfectly suited for that. Um, so let me first of all check my mic is on, right? You guys can hear me? All right, I'll talk to myself for 20 minutes. So let me talk, I'm going to talk about why you should be a professional engineer. And I have on the bottom left there, what does the professor know about professional engineering? I'm picturing what you know, students would be saying. So um, I'm old. I um, spent about 17 years out of college designing bridges for a couple different companies and uh, two great companies. I enjoyed working with both of them. And for a number of years since then, I've been a professor. So I do have you know, some of the consulting experience. And so um, I'm going to be kind of talking about it from that point of view. So, you know, what is an engineer? An engineer is, is someone who's licensed and you're licensed because your, your, your job is to protect the public. It's so important that states have required licensure. And it's, again, just to protect the public. Um, I tell my students all the time, if this were a board game or younger students, if this were a video game, the object of the game, the object of your career is to become a licensed engineer. That's where you're working. That's the ultimate goal of where you want to go. And you can do other great things, but that is where you want to go. Now, don't get me wrong. Masters is great. You know, a lot of us have them and, and I have nothing negative to say about it at all. But really being a licensed engineer is what is most important. And I'll explain, I'll explain why. Again, I'm not knocking in a master's or a doctorate. That's great. But license, being licensed is really what it's about. So let me show you a couple of things. So years ago, I taught at Rowan. That's where I taught with Jared and I teach at Mercer now and then I also teach at night at the College of New Jersey and I've seen great students. The, the future generation of engineering is, is set. We have fantastic students coming. But over the years, I have heard some students talk to me about why they do not want to become a licensed engineer. So what I did is I list some of the things that I've heard 
And then I'm gonna kind of go through my little talk and then we'll come back and address these. So let me go through them. So some students will say, you know, I don't want the responsibility of signing and sealing design plans. They think that's too much responsibility. I don't wanna be liable for potential mistakes. I don't wanna be sued and don't wanna to have to get my own insurance, error and omission insurance, which I'll talk about. I completed enough education. I don't wanna take two more engineering exams, the two more exams that you, you would take to become licensed. Um, I don't wanna to have to take multiple engineering exams for each state where I practice. I don't wanna get a master's degree. That one's becoming very popular these days. Um, I can make just as much money without a professional engineering license, okay? So again, these are things that we've heard. So let's go through this and then we'll come back and address these. So did you know that in most states, you're not allowed to refer to yourself as an engineer unless you're licensed? Now think about that for a minute. My brother is a, a computer engineer. He's not licensed. And I made a point to share to tell him that all the time that he had business cards and he was handing them out saying he was an engineer. And I would say just to get under his skin, it's what you do as brothers is no, you're not, you're not licensed. So, um, and in some states, um, well, in most states, they prohibit it. Honestly, most states don't go after you for it, but it is something you, you shouldn't do. Um, and I, there's some confusion for that. A lot of, uh, where, you know, where I teach students come in and not even sure what engineering is. It's because it, the word engineer is used so much that people don't even know what it is anymore. So I, I work with a friend of mine who was, uh, I, I know him from high school and he used to, back in high school, he used to pump gas, you know, like high school folks do. And on his resume to describe pumping gas, he described himself as a fuel exchange engineer to try to make it sound good. And he would say, that, you know, oh, I have some engineering experience. I, I was in fuel exchange. So these are examples of you're not allowed to do that if you're not licensed. And if you think about this, imagine, you know, Princeton is right next to Mercer, one of the top schools in the world, right? And I'm certain that the professors there are among the most knowledgeable people. You know, Einstein used to teach there, so I'm, I'm thinking they're, they're pretty bright. Having said that, if you're a professor with a PhD, but you're not licensed, as an engineer, in many instances, construction, arbitration, and so forth, you would not be permitted to give testimony. In other words, you're not considered a professional unless you're licensed. So I just want that to sink in. That's how important it is to be licensed. So we say a legal necessity, like I say, if you want to become a consulting engineer, if you want to prepare plans that are submitted to some public authority, the Department of Transportation, Army Corps of Engineers, even, you know, your local township, if you're des designing a smaller project, you must be a licensed engineer. And I can tell you from some of my experiences, I've presented at variance meetings where you, you speak on behalf of a client and the zoning or the board is in front of you. And the first thing they do is they want to know before they even listen to what you have to say, they want to know your background. And the first time I did that, I said, well, I went to this school, I got this degree, and they didn't care. As soon as I said, I'm licensed as a professional engineer in New Jersey, they stopped me and they said, good enough, we'll, we'll listen to you. So it's, it's that important, like I say, that you want to be licensed. So, you know, some of the benefits you get, you know, public respect. Um, we heard Tom talk about public information meetings. When you work on a project, you have to go out and speak to the public. And Chris mentioned this as well. Um, you meet folks from the public and, you know, when they hear that you're licensed, they, you know, they certainly assume you know a certain amount. Um, peer esteem is very helpful when you meet other people that are licensed. You kind of each know what you've had to do to get to that point. So there is a certain amount of comfort that comes with that. Career development, I've been told that um, different companies have different policies, but some companies, for example, wouldn't might not allow you to become a, a shareholder, might not allow you to move up to a, at a certain point if you weren't licensed. Um, the thinking behind that is in order for you to be beneficial to the client and to be um, where the client would be able to, to come to you, you know, you would be licensed to do that. So um, the idea is getting licensed is not only helpful, you know, as far as your career, it's helpful maybe even in your company, your company without that, you maybe could only go to a certain level. Um, one of the things at the bottom there is expert witness. So you've heard Chris talk about design and Jared talk about construction and, and they both alluded to it. Um, on occasion, construction jobs 
uh, rec you know, not everything goes perfectly. And I say that tongue in cheek. I go so far as probably to say just about every job, there's something that doesn't go well. And when they really doesn't go well, if you get to the point where there's some kind of legal proceeding, and then what will happen is there'll be two sides, you know, two attorneys, each attorney will hire an engineer to, you know, kind of prove their case. And these engineers have to be professional engineers. So if you want to serve as an expert witness, you have to be licensed as well. And quick side note, in case you didn't know, expert witnesses make somewhere around $300 to $500 an hour. So uh, not that money should be your only motivation, but that helps, I would think. Um, it gives you some flexibility have, being licensed. Um, you can do like we just heard. There's design, construction. You can get involved with scheduling, cost estimating, teaching, right? You know, again, shameless plug. We're always looking for great engineers. Um, and same thing at four-year schools. They're always looking for adjunct professors. Um, most recently, I have had experience being a construction arbitrator. And just to briefly, to give you an idea what that is, is instead of going to a court, two sides would agree in advance when they sign their contract that if there is a dispute, they'll go to what's called binding arbitration. And what that means, instead of going to a judge, you go to an arbitrator. And here's my point. The qualifications for an arbitrator in a construction you guessed what I'm about to say is be a licensed engineer with a certain amount of experience. And I've done that a bit. I got to tell you, it's, it's the most fun in the world to all of a sudden be treated like a judge. I mean, you don't wear the robe and it's not, it is on the construction site, but you have two attorneys and they're expert witnesses and you get to listen to everything and ask questions. And then you, you make a binding arbitration, which means your ruling is final. So that's a lot of fun. And again, you wouldn't be able to do that if you weren't licensed. Um, Money, study, you know, studies have shown you make more money as a licensed engineer, right? So, and if you haven't noticed, I'm trying to rush through this to get us back on schedule, but let me come back to what we said in the beginning. So addressing these misconceptions that I've heard over the years. Number one, I don't want the responsibility of signing and sealing plans. My response to that is you got to challenge yourself. You know, you want to, over the years of working on a project, you're going to, you know, get more and more confident, more and more experience. And you're going to want to experience the post, the personal growth and satisfaction that comes along with signing a set of plans. My poor family, I live in Marlton and we worked among other jobs on a bridge that's right down the road from my house. And anybody who will listen when we drive by that, I'm constantly talking about that. And that was one that I was able to sign and seal as part of a great team that include Jared, right? Who also did a fantastic job. So when people say you don't want the responsibility, yeah, you do. You just don't know you do yet. You will at some point. Um, second one, I don't want to be liable for potential mistakes. So your company is going to have what's called error and omission insurance. Now, first of all, remember when you design a thing, someone's going to check it, at least one person. There are going to be a number of people that check things. So it's highly unlikely you're going to make such a mistake that something's going to fall down. There might be small mistakes with quantities. Jared, we never made mistakes, right, on our plans. I don't think we ever made one, but, um, but I could be mistaken. But um, it's a, that's like saying, uh, you know, I don't want a car because I might get into an accident. If, of course you want to uh, work towards something. We're engineers. We're trying to innovate. Um, so don't worry about liability. Your company has insurance for you. Um, I don't want to be sued, and I don't want to have to get my own insurance. And I'll see the answer above. Your company has the insurance. And by the way, if for any reason you wanted to get your own error and omission insurance, because I still practice and I have my own there's nothing to be scared about. It's like getting car insurance. It's a piece of cake. So there's nothing, nothing to be, you know, uh, there's nothing to be afraid of when it comes to that. And to kind of round it up, I can, one of the things I hear, I complete enough education. I don't want to take two more tests. Yeah, it's two more tests, but it's spread over four years. You're going to take one test when you're a senior and when you graduate and you take another one four years later, they're not that bad. And um, almost every four year school has, um, exam review classes, you know, oftentimes for free. And I say to my students all the time, how hard can the exam be if I passed it, right? It can't be that hard. It's not. If you practice and study, you're going to pass. It's, it's, let's put it this way. If you made it through differential equations, it's all downhill from there. It should have no problem. Um, I don't want to have to take multiple PE exams for each state. In general, when you pass the exam once, you will not have to take a test again. So, Myself, I took uh, my exam in, in Pennsylvania, but I'm licensed in a few different states. I only took the test once. 
and then to to practice in another state, you just fill out some paperwork and give them, you know, some money. Um, that's not exactly the case. You know, I, I was instructional engineering. So if you wanted to work out in California, for example, where there's a lot more going on with seismic, there are more tests. But in general, of the 50 states, one exam and you'll be able to practice almost everywhere. Right. Um, I don't want to get a master's degree. Well, as of right now, a master's degree is not required to become a licensed engineer. I say as of right now, there is a small push only in civil engineering, as what I'm told, so not mechanical, not electrical, but in civil engineering, only for structural engineering, there's a push by some folks to make a master's degree mandatory. And we're a ways away from that. Like I say, there's a push and there's a lot of steps to go through. The National Society of Professional Engineers does not support that. So we'll see what happens. But the bottom line is you do not need a master's right now to become a professional engineer. But it could happen if your structure is in the future, which just means get it now, get it as soon as you can, get your license. And then you can't make as much money, you can make just as much without a professional engineering license. That's not true, absolutely not true. And there's a bunch of data that would show that being licensed really opens you up to all kinds of opportunities. So, um, you know, I guess kind of in, in sum with this, and my students are sick, I'm sure Anita and Bunny will tell you this, um, this, when I, I don't ask my students, are you going to be licensed? It's, it's a mandatory. You will go on to become li licensed. It's something that you need to do um, because you do it, do it while you're young too, because a lot of us, you get older, like if I had to go back and I mentioned differential equations, I would be a mess to have to remember that stuff now. So you want to, you know, get it out of your way now. So that's what I had as far as how to become an engineer. Hopefully you will consider that. I'd be happy to try to answer any questions that anyone has. Jim, there's a, a, just a couple questions. Um, um, uh, Jared asks, what do you see as the biggest threat to the professional engineering profession? Well, there's always, um, when you say the threat, so without getting into politics, there are some people, there are some groups, I won't mention which political side, there are some groups that feel that licensing is hindering people's ability to start businesses. So some people have argued, you have a degree, that should be enough, you should not need a license. Um, you can tell where I'm coming from. I completely disagree with that. I, I don't know that, um, I don't see that there really should be, you know, a hindrance to being licensed. There's going to be always disagreements, like we talk about masters, not a masters. But um, it, it's the kind of thing, that if it's been around so long, it, it is only a good thing as far as providing safety. So that's, that's my thought on that. A, a little bit off topic, but uh, Richard asked, what do you enjoy about teaching in a community college? Several things. So uh, I, I used to hate timesheets. So, you know, when we were designing a thing, we had a giant timesheet, you know, Jerry could talk about this. We would come across something and we could say we could A, take a day to figure out this thing, or B, do it in half the time. We know it's going to be safe and move on and make some money. And, you, you know, that's what you do as a business. And, and it, when you teach, there, we, we always look into everything. And, it, you know, I'd like to talk a lot, so we get way into it. But there's really nothing better than seeing the talent of students. These, these folks, the talent that they don't realize that they have. And once they realize what they have, it's nice to feel like I had a real, real small part and will, will eventually be a, a very successful career for them couple of uh, uh, useful comments, really. Uh, uh, one says, recommend take the EIT as a college senior versus waiting when you have been away from other aspects that could be covered in the EIT. I think uh, all of us would, would echo that sentiment. The, the sooner you can take it, the better. And uh, George said uh, he agrees, work towards your PE and obtain as soon as you have the required experience. Because uh, the other S, uh, uh, issue he brings up is, you know, life starts to get in the way as you get older and may limit your ability to put the effort into prep and studying. Um, if you can get through engineering school, you can pass the exam if you put in the effort. And I would certainly echo that statement. And there's some others that have, have, have echoed that as well. And again, George makes the point that most companies will assist with PE registration and review courses. Uh, that's certainly been my experience as well. So I think a, a lot of us professionals are echoing your sentiments. It's uh, you, uh, you spend a lot of time getting your degree. Uh, you should get out there and take the next step. Don't be afraid of it. It's it's a great life. 
may I introduce Jen Lanning now? Is that okay? Okay. So Absolutely. Yep. So Jen, I've known Jen. Uh, we went to grad school together at Drexel. Jen, Jen went, uh, got her bachelor's at Rutgers, and then we went to school at night back in the old days when there was no online stuff. And um, then I worked for her. I worked for a consulting company, Majeski and Masters, great company, along with Urban, which is also a great company. But I was with M&M, and um, Jen was with the Army Corps of Engineers, and they were one of our clients. So it was funny. During the in the evening, we'd be in class together, and then the next day we'd be at a meeting, and she was everybody's boss. Uh, she was a great boss. Um, she's going to, to be at Pannoni. She's done some fantastic things. So um, we're really uh, pleased to have you, Jen. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now. And uh, let's see if I do this right. Okay. Um, can everybody see? Um, can, can everybody see uh, my screen now? Blue, blue slides? Okay. Terrific. Yes. Um, well, I, I have to tell you, I before I start, I really appreciate the opportunity. You know, I, I love Jim. We've been friends, like you said, for like, you know, probably 25 years now. I mean, gosh. And uh, it's always been a good uh, source of advice for me. But I think that, you know, as I sit here and I listen to all these other people talk, I just want all of you young folks, you, you, know, you students to appreciate the joy you hear. Um, you know, it translates to you. So Jim asked me, normally I talk about bridges. Um, I'm a bridge, let me, let me just say, you know, the transition. So my job is I am the uh, bridge inspection practice leader at Pannoni. Um, I am, I set policy. I don't manage people. I manage projects. I'm like a super PM. I manage joint ventures and multi-million dollar uh, bridge inspection projects for the mid-Atlantic region statewide. And, um, so a subject matter expert just in bridge inspection. So the little bit of stuff that you heard from uh, Chris in the previous speaking about bridge inspection, that's just what um, I do all the time. And, and some of you folks ask like how you progress through your career. I used to do the actual inspections. Now I just mostly yell at everybody about doing the inspections um, and, and those sorts of things. Uh, my experience is close, to, is close to 30 years. In February, it'll be 30 years. Um, hard to believe uh, the last year has been tough, but I think, um, I think, you know, it, again, it's something that, that I absolutely love to do. Um, I was working in the public side as a, for the Army Corps of Engineers for 15 years, and then I've been in the private sector uh, for 15 years. And uh, again, some of the greatest things, um, you know, Jim and other people talk about their kids and you know, uh, we drive around and my kids are like either saying to me, oh, did you do that bridge? Or they're like, don't tell me what you see when we stop as we drive underneath. They're like, it's like having death on our shoulder. You know, you're always looking up and seeing what's wrong with stuff. We don't want to know. Um, so uh, my exposure to graduate engineers and junior engineering staff is primarily through project management. Um, we, you know, these folks come on board and, and just so you know, uh, Jared, we do ask our new hires if they're afraid of heights. <laughs> um, you know, if they're comfortable at height is the way we put it because, you know, we do uh, at Pannoni anywhere from bridges that are, you know, the Bay Bridge over the Chesapeake Bay, um, you know, the Bay, the um, Henry Hudson Bridge, you know, very large structures all the way down to, you know, structures in, in uh, small areas, timber bridges and that kind of thing. So. We really need to have people that are comfortable, but my exposure to graduate engineers and junior engineering staff, which would be people of your age and experience coming on board into companies, is primarily that. You know, they're new, they've just showed up, they need to know how to do uh, their job. And, and that's in addition to having, you know, been you at one time myself. So, um, so I think when you're thinking about transitioning from college to industry, the first thing I would say to you is it's really important to reset yourself. This isn't college anymore. You, you know, your parents will tell you, you know, oh, you know, you need to grow up and get it together. Well, I'm telling you as a potential employer, you need to grow up and get it together, okay? Because you have to understand that this is a major shift. You know, you're going to be, you know, and if you're already, you know, one of those people that has a job and you're going to school um, part-time or whatever, you kind of understand what I'm saying. It's a completely different mindset. Um, you have to have a plan, like where do you want to go with your career? Um, 
some it doesn't have to be the day you walk in the door but you need to kind of figure it out I kind of knew what I wanted to do and then about a year in somebody said to me do you want to be the bridge guy in in the Army Corps in Philadelphia and I I, I said yes before they even finished the sentence because I wanted to be the bridge guy but I needed to plan out like how was I going to get to that so observe people around you and and who's in charge and do you want that job someday or does this interest you folks that walk in the door you know right out of school and go I'm the project manager well that's not going to happen you know you got to have a lot of experience you got to have a, a way to you know understand how your work fits in with everybody else so have a plan or, or at least start to figure out your plan okay and you need to find a mentor and a mentor always should be somebody two steps above you so it shouldn't be like you know your friend or you know even your boss it should be two steps beyond that and you should really make an effort to kind of to ask that person hey can i come to you for advice um on how to talk to people or what am i doing wrong here and having that person that's kind of removed from you is very very helpful um so then I have a few more main points of advice and it's gonna, you know, I'm trying to go for a little humor. So, you know, bear with me while I do that. Uh, let's see. Okay, so first of all, your boss is not your friend, okay? So, you know, you're coming from college and maybe your professor like Dr. Macarell is your friend. You know, you can go to him, you can joke around. Well, that, your boss is not your friend. Um, your direct manager also may not be your, you know, your real boss, the person who signs your timesheet. They may be another engineer who's working just like you. Um, your, you know, your college, so this is more about like the social experience of work, right? Your colleagues may, they're gonna range in age and circumstance and experience. So, you know, you're gonna come in and be all excited and, you know, like a big happy puppy and some of these people are gonna be there a long time and, and you're gonna annoy them. So you have to kind of just, you know, gauge yourself, right? So be, be understanding of these, you know, how everyone else, diversity, you know, and, and, you're, and everyone's not, you know, brand new. So you gotta do with that. Everyone has work to do and it's your job to do yours. So don't make excuses. Nobody wants to know about your car broke down and you were late and my dog ate my homework. You just have to do your job. You really do. And you will gain so much respect from everybody else if something goes wrong and you say, I screwed up and I'll fix it. That's the bottom line, okay? And then fin finally, and this I've learned the hard way sometimes, okay? But be discreet and be mindful of what you share about yourself because the walls are not big a lot of the times. You're in cubicles. You're telling your friend about, you know, how you went out this weekend and you party till you dropped and all these things and maybe your boss is on the other side of the wall maybe there's somebody who's picking a new team on the other side of that cubicle as you're telling everybody this and they go you know what maybe i don't want that guy on my team you know maybe i don't want them if they're not going to be you know they're going to be all over the place so just kind of be mindful of what you share and i think you know there's a time and a place so those are the kind of that's the advice i have from from the social you know, experiment type things, okay? Um, let's see, change the slide. Be on time. Uh, you know, you probably heard it a million times, right? Get to work on time. Don't sneak out early, you, you know, just be honest if you have to leave early. You know, and we all have this new world of COVID and everyone's working for, we have brand new people that came on board literally two weeks before COVID started. And then we've just brought on our new young engineers like over the summer. I can only imagine how difficult it must be for them to come to come into the office and no one's there or to work from home. So it's even more appropriate for you to be on time, log on at the right time, you know, show up if they want you in a meeting. Um, you know, if we're back in the office ever, you know, be on time to and from lunch, you know, and your breaks because someone's looking for you, you know, and, and needs to talk to you. And I think again, this, if, if I could, you know, have a nickel for every time I've had this conversation, turn your assignments in on time. And if you can't, you better tell the person that you owe them to well in advance. You have to adjust and kind of gate, unless everybody has this grand plan, I'm going to get this paper done this weekend. And you realize when you start that it's really like a two weekend paper, right? 
Well, that happens in, in engineering too, where you tell this, these people, you know, you're not going to get work from just one person. You're going to get a pile of work and you're going to have to prioritize it. Again, it's a new world. It's, you know, you're an adult and you're a working person. You need to be realistic and say, I'm not going to make it. And you can't tell them you're not going to make it five minutes before it's due. You have to tell them in enough time that they can get you help. Um, that's really one of the biggest complaints I have about, you know, just anyone, not just young folks, but anybody, you know, you have to tell me in enough time that I can solve the problem. Coming in my office at five minutes still and saying, I didn't finish the report, that doesn't help anybody. All right, next one. So, so here we're back to communicate, right? So people, including your boss and your boss's boss and all these things, they can't read your mind. They don't know uh, that you're not going to make something on time. They don't know that you have a doctor's appointment next week. They also don't know that you don't have anything to do. If you run out of things to do, you have to just be, you have to go around and, and basically annoy people and, and tell them you're still here. You have, you need something, you would like to get involved in that project. One of the, one of the best young engineers I have who works for me right now, he, we had him as an intern and we had him for a summer and then school started and we said, hey, we don't really have a ton of work for you, but if you want to come in and do your homework in here and we can give you about 12 hours a week. Well, he's like, okay. Well, next thing I know, the kid's in there like every afternoon and before he sits down to do his work, he walked around the office and he asked everybody if they had anything for them to do and drove everybody crazy to the point where they gave him stuff to do so he would go sit down and he became the best, you know, I mean, it was the best hire we ever made. So. I think, you know, he was determined that he was going to let people know that he was around. Um, some of the other things I see, you know, from, from the incoming young graduate engineers is, you know, a lot to do with written communication, you know, writing emails clearly with a salutation and a closing, like, hello, you know, so-and-so, and thanks, and would sign your name. Um, you know, a signature block on your email, if I could tell you how many times I'm sitting by the side of the road, going through my emails, trying to find somebody's phone number, and they don't have a signature block, and a lot of companies make you do it, but I don't know how people get out of it, um, you know, so that I can call that person instead of, you know, I, I need to find them, you know. Um, don't use text speaker spelling in your emails. <laughs> people do it, and it drives me crazy. Um, Check your, your spell, and someone did it once to a client, which about sent me over the edge, but you know. Um, check your spelling and your grammar, because I think that in the age of written communication, like emails, we put a lot of um, our opinion about someone based upon whether their emails are coherent and they have make sense and they have good grammar. So if you don't, if you have misspellings in your email, I'm not gonna appreciate what you're trying to say. I'm more focused on the, the spelling and the grammar. Uh, don't ramble. I hope I'm not doing that, but you know, don't ramble um, and speak professionally again, like, you know, really, and I'm not really the best always example of that, but profanity and, and those kinds of things, you know, there's field, there's field or outside talk and then there's office talk. So um, those kinds of things I think will help in, in kind of moving forward, you know, into um, industry. People talk about dress code and you know, I think it's changed a lot um, from when I was a young engineer, obviously, but I think the big thing is, is like dress for the job you want, not the one you have. Someone told me that one time. So, you know, I think that's probably a good value, um, a valuable piece of information. I think the other things are keep extra clothes in your car, your desk, like a tie or a nicer shirt, just in case you know, you suddenly get pulled into a meeting. Um, I remember one time I went out in the field and I came back to the office and I didn't realize that the president of Pannoni was stopping by and uh, I was not dressed like, you know, super great. I was in field clothes. So, you know, in retrospect, I wish I'd had like a, you know, a nicer outfit or something that to try on that day. Um, and keep weather related or field clothes in your car just in case, because the reverse happened to me. I was at the office something hit a bridge and they're like, Jen, let's go. And I'm hanging off of a boat over icy water in like, you know, waders because I didn't have anything but a skirt on that day. So, you know, needless to say, it was uh, an interesting experience. So, um, so I think Jared talked about this a little bit in his talk, but 
I, this is how I try and, you know, live my life or at least my professional life, you know, most of the time is being in a place of yes. And I think this is the best advice I can give you, which is, you know, take on assignments that might be scary or ones you don't know how to do. Because here's the thing, you're not going to know how to do everything. And I've had people turn down jobs or positions or kind of like roles that I've offered them. And afterward, I'm like, why did you do that? And they said, well, because I didn't know how to do what you were asking me to do. And I thought to myself, well, of course not. Of course not. You didn't know. It was, a, it was an advancement. It was an opportunity. So some of the best decisions I've made in my career have been because I said yes before the person finished the sentence. Like I said, do you want to be the bridge guy? Yes. Um, you know, when I came over to Pannoni and about a year after I joined the company, they said to me, and literally I had just bought a house in the same town as the office. They said, do you want to run the Maryland office? And I said, yes. And he said, don't you want to ask your husband? I was like, no, <laughs> no we're doing it. So, but I said, yes, because it was the right move. Um, and, and it turned out to be a great opportunity. So, um, you know, don't turn down overtime or travel, especially travel. Like, you know, I think, you know, again, it's COVID, so nobody's going anywhere. But uh, I think just those chances, I, I had an assignment once where I worked for FEMA, you know, for the Army Corps and FEMA for, you know, six weeks, and got to do, you know, disaster response. Uh, you know, I've been to some of the best places in the world, you know, that I that I can think of. And don't hesitate to go to a meeting or in the field with a more senior person, because that face-to-face -face time, that time in the car, a time out in the, you know, I, I, I had one, one time I, I walked the entire Beachville of Ocean City behind the guy I wanted to learn from, and I carried his stupid briefcase the whole way, in jeans, in the summertime, you know, did it, because I wanted to learn from him, and, you know, he's still a friend of mine today, so I think that's another thing, you know, don't hesitate, don't just say yes, even if you don't know, you can figure it out, I promise, it's not that difficult. Um, and then finally, I think, uh, you know, Chris Shelley talked about this, get involved. So you want to join an organization, you know, younger member groups, those kinds of things. Go to the webinars that people have at lunchtime and not just because they have sandwiches, okay? You'll be really surprised. There's a lot of food in the engineering world. We, you know, when, it, when we're all back in the office, there's always somebody doing something with, then with lunch, but go to the webinars. Um, some offices, you know, again, they have softball or volleyball teams or bowling, you know, that kind of thing. And make a point of joining people when they all go, hey, come down here for cake. I mean, if you're on a, you know, restricted diet or something, you don't want the cake, that's fine. But go down there and, and meet people and hang out. It makes a big difference when you're trying to create a team and, um, and have a good experience. Um, my contact information is here. You can always get it from Dr. Macarella. If you ever want to transition to college from through industry from college, we're always looking for people. So I got to throw that in there. Um, but uh, again, I you know I I'll take questions. I see the things flashing at me. And someone want to read them to me, or I can look at the thing, tell me what to do. But I love my job, and I love being um, in the position that I'm in. And so you know, this is just my advice. So. Jennifer, I'll read you off a, a, a couple of uh, questions and comments. Um, sure. You call me Jen, by the way. I don't go by Jen. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> uh, That's okay. Um, so um, uh, uh, Jared was saying, uh, you were talking about mentors earlier and mm -hmm. that, uh, agrees that finding a mentor is key, but in practice, uh, he's found this to be difficult. Any tips on finding a, a mentor? And then he, he uh, gratuitously sucked up to Jim as a great mentor. Yeah. Um, what, so finding a mentor, you know, I was in a program at the Army Corps, like a leadership program, and they forced us to find a mentor. And, you know, I, first of all, I think you need to find someone who's going to be honest with you. Okay. You need to find someone who's going to be honest. And my mentor, I still, again, I still talk to him today. He's at a different company. And um, he taught, he talked to me one day and he said some hard things. He's like, you know, you need to do some things differently, you know, and I was in like a tough place at the time, you know, we all go through ups and downs and, and I couldn't figure out what was, what was really going on with, you know, a bunch of different things. And he said, I just need you to hear me, you know, you need to be 
nicer than you think you're being, you know, some, you're rubbing some people the wrong way. And that was hard to hear, but it really solidified that, you know, this person that you're asking to be your mentor, they need to understand how the company works or the organization, you know, if you do a, a public in, a agency and they need to be able to be honest with you, you know, and, and if they're not going to be honest and they're going to tell you all the time that you're super fabulous, they're not the person that is your a good mentor you know you need and then they need to be encouraging and they need to say try this it might stink but try it and that's you know i don't know very parental i don't know i mean i don't want to say that because you know but uh my mom always told me what she thought and told me to do things i didn't want to do either so you know. Co that's just my of, couple of comments carrie had mentioned also that sometimes the mentor finds you and and that uh, i i agree and sometimes that can be the best mentor right it, it sort of happens organically Yes, um, and you can have more than one too. You know, it's not a problem to if you, as long, you know, that's okay too. So, uh, on on one of the other topics, Scott mentioned that, uh, and this is uh, good advice for everybody to know that uh, the printer does always seem to break down on the day of submittal, and that sort of goes to your point of, you know, uh, sort of planning ahead, not being uh, a procrastinator because it will bite you, and you can uh, you can get yourself into some big jams that way. Were you listening to my conversation with my team yesterday when they, they, yeah, I'll get back to the office in time from the field to print the 17 reports? No, you won't. Don't. Okay. <laughs> no, you won't. <laughs> so what else? Roger asked a question, said, uh, do you agree that internships are like an ongoing job interview? It sets you up for a job once you graduate and it's a good mechanism uh, to look into before uh, you graduate, well before. It's a little, you know, it's a little like dating, you know, if you got, if you like it, both people can say, we don't want to do this anymore. Um, or you can turn around, you know, and, uh, you know, you graduate and you show up the next day. I mean, that's how Pannoni treats it. We like to give you this shot and we like to have you come back and we like you to, you know, show up the day after graduation if you're a good fit. And so, um, you know, I think internships are a great chance. You know, I interned at the Army Corps for two summers. And let me tell you something. I did the worst pro jobs the things that you know that nobody wanted to do i wrote specifications which let me tell you you know is a thing and everybody was like you know and it's funny because i showed up and everyone kind of thought oh she's just somebody's kid who's here which i wasn't anybody's kid but they thought you were just somebody's kid who was here and, and i said to them hey listen I, I don't you're asking me to type this but you know and this was back where there was a lot of computers so you know bear with me but He's like, you know, I, I ask questions and he goes, well, why do you care? Just do it. And I said, I'm an engineering student. And they're like, oh my God. And boom, all of a sudden, you know, so that's, you know, how I ended up at the core. I turned down other jobs for that because I wanted to work there. So, you know, I think you, you get an internship and if it's a good fit, you know, find a way to do part-time work through the school year and show up, you know, because they'll hire you, you know, they'll hire you. Emma, Emma asks a, a question that could be a whole uh, 45 minute uh, uh, session probably. How would you describe a successful engineer? You know, I, I think a lot about that because, you know, first of all, again, you, you, the best thing about engineers, and I, you know, I do a lot with work with the Boy Scouts and Engineering Merit Badge, and I talk a lot with other students, but I think the thing is, is that you can find almost any single thing in civil engineering to do that you love. Like, I love bridges, but you know what? Beyond loving bridges, I'm a bridge inspection expert, and that's this like narrow thing. And I found it, and it's like what I love. And anybody, if you spend enough time and you figure it out, you can find that thing that you love, and it and and you can almost create your own job. So, you know, I feel like a successful engineer is somebody who makes a difference in people's lives. That's our job. You know, I I always tell people. You know, you watch the Big Bang Theory and the other guys were always making fun of poor Howard, you know, and, and I'm telling you, Howard's the man, you know, the rest of them are just talking about stuff that's out here. You know, Howard's the one building the stuff. That's our job. We build stuff. We fix things. We solve problems. So if you solved one problem in your career, just one, I think you're successful. And if you're happy and you're being productive, that's successful in my mind. Here, here. Uh, the last uh, thing I've got in the chat pod is uh, Anita wants to let folks know that uh, she wants to share her talent and she's happy to have an internship. So uh, Anita, Anita at, at least is available. So uh, reach out and contact her. Uh, excellent. Yeah, she can get my info from Dr. Macarella, so. That's all but. we got in the chat pod for now.
Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate the opportunity. And, um, you know, I think you guys are doing some great things. You know, um, the student group, I, I get really invigorated by talking to students. So thank you for having me. Nita, I think that's back to you and Bundy. Okay, so I'm going to talk about how to join um, an ASH uh, student chapter. So let me go back to my PowerPoint if I can find it. Oh, uh, oh gosh. I can't get to it now. Um, so. Um, never mind. So that's not happening. <laughs> I shared it before and now I can't pull it back up. So <clears throat> I'm going to talk about how to join an ASH uh, student chapter. Um, but I'm going to start off with talking a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Anita, as you know, and I would like to begin my presentation with a significant story, my pledge to the American Society of Highway Engineers student chapter in Mercer County. I started my first semester at Mercer in the fall of 2018, majoring in, in accounting. But throughout that entire semester, somewhere in the back of my conscience, a little bird kept insisting that I took on a more challenging and interesting major. So before the spring semester started, I switched to, uh, I switched to civil engineering technology. And that is when I met my first greatest mentor, who happens to be the advisor of the Ash Club at Mercer County College, Dr. Jim Macarella. But it was not until the fall semester of 2018 that I actually had the privilege to obtain an excellent education in civil engineering with the assistance of a very knowledgeable professors like Professor Krauss and Macarella. To this day, I can recall this moment precisely. It was a Tuesday, September 10th, 2019 um, at four o'clock p.m. Right after our mechanics and materials class, I was gathering my books together, getting ready to go home when a young lady, Bundy Sanin, approached me and asked me if I would like to be a member of the Ash student chapter. I said, okay. <clears throat> and I remember Dr. Macarella mentioned Ash on more than one occasion before class, and I was curious about it. So of course I asked Bundy what Ash was. And she described to me that it was an organization for everyone involved in the highway industry. Now that information was new to me and it caught my attention because I knew the highway industry consists of various powerful engineering contractors, consultants, designers, suppliers, and well, you all know those continues. Additionally, Ms. Sanin pointed out that there are thousands of members across the United States with hundreds of sections, but more so in our region. She assured me that this would be an excellent opportunity for students like myself to expand their resumes through networking, self-sufficiency, internships, full-time employment after graduation, and not to mention the American Society of Engineers offers scholarships to qualified engineering students on a yearly basis. This news was super exciting to me because I am not that financially stable as I would like to be. So I asked her, how do I join? The young lady responded by handing me a piece of paper and said, all you have to do is write down your name, your email, and your phone number. And that was it. Surprised, I thought there was more to it. So I asked, what is that simple? So without thinking twice, I wrote my information down on a piece of paper and handed it back to her. As we parted ways, I suddenly came to mind that I neglected to ask her what my responsibilities were. So right after my first ASH meeting the next day, I saw her in Dr. Macarella's classroom. I strolled up to her and asked, now what do I have to do as a new member of the ASH student chapter? She informed me that all I had to do is go to bi-monthly meetings at the school, undertake in campus projects, perform fundraisers, and identify motivated students within our civil engineering program. After a few weeks of eagerly participating in every meeting, I was elected to become vice president and secretary of the Ash student chapter in Mercer County. This was the beginning of a very exciting time in my life. As the president and secretary of Ash at Mercer County, I actively participated in organizing 
on campus meetings where we invited interesting professionals in the engineering field to speak at our meetings like this. I identify a considerable number of diverse students who would make a great perspective, uh, who would make great perspective leaders and potentially improve our club. I helped with organizing field trips that included providing means of transportation to those students who needed it to and from construction sites, museums, and special events, of course, with the help of the ASH section. I volunteered in joint activities between section and student chapters. I assisted with coordinating conferences and special events, and I attended as many ASH section meetings, job fairs, and conferences as I could. But lately, it has been more of a challenge to communicate with undergraduates. One reason behind this falls into the aspect of most individuals not willing to open up an email, especially if they don't know who it's coming from. But who can blame them with all the hackers going hackers today? So due to this COVID-19 epidemic, there is no more lunch or dinner events. These special events regularly provided students and professionals alike an expansion in their social networking. Um, now I cannot offer the free dinner ticket that I often manipulated, convincing young classmates into joining ASH. Now attempting to allure these young youthful minds to these special online events is more of a task. <laughs> but the fact that I am more of a face-to-face -face person is much easier when I could, it was much easier when I could walk up to someone, introduce myself, and strike up a conversation, then approach, uh, I'm sorry, in person. This approach is obviously impossible online. Unfortunately, this epidemic is not going anywhere anytime soon. As a result, I am working on a, on a solution for recruiting undergraduates to ASH student chapter through social media. I want to pass the torch and show them what ASH has done for me. Through the student ASH chapter, uh, I'm sorry, I'm so nervous. <laughs> and it was supposed to be a PowerPoint covering my face, so, you know. <laughs> As a result, I am currently working on a solution and I want to pass the torch and show them what ASH has done to me. Through the student ASH chapter at Mercer, I have gained more knowledge about myself, my goals, and my strength that I never knew I had. One being that I had a niche in highway construction, developed new relationships with a wide selection of engineering personnel, has rendered a new confidence about entering the construction industry. Then I am team oriented. With the encouragement of fellow club members, I have learned to become a valuable team player, giving and taking advice in an array of situations. I learned that I that I had is oh my goodness. I learned that I have exceptional people skills, allowing me to effectively interact and communicate with other students and professionals. I adapted new leadership skills like project management, event planning, and fundraising. Becoming a leadership position has taught me a lot of patience, has improved the way I manage my time, and has given me the opportunity to connect with fun, talented, and creative individuals. <clears throat> and above all, I am confident that this new profound self-awareness and knowledge will be an enormous asset in my future career, as it will any student who joins the ASH cha student chapter. Participating in the ASH club will give engineering scholars the practical experience they will surely utilize in the future civil engineering role. In closing, I would like to thank that man the many fantastic professionals at ASH, all of you, the caring staff at Mercer County College, Macarella, Krauss, and some others, and my peers at the Ash Student Chapter for their support on this incredible journey together. At the end of the spring semester, I am proud to say that I will be the, fir that I will be the first person in my family to graduate from college with honors. I'm truly, yeah, I can truly say that this has been the smartest decision I've made in a long time, resulting in a remarkable overall experience that will that I will treasure forever. After Mercer, I plan to continue to achieve my goal with a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the New Jersey Institute of Technology, where I will continue to circulate the benefits of ASH to incoming scholars with inquiring minds, improving their skills, building strong relationships, generating ideas, and most of all, having fun, learning from one another. Thank you. That's it. Are there any questions? No Bobby, questions. Are you gonna say anything? Nope. Um, if, 
there's no more yeah, questions. Yeah, I'm ready to go next. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Bundy. Um, so I would like to talk about how to form a student chapter. So the first step uh, uh, of becoming a student chapter is to be an active member. You know, don't be afraid to approach other students like myself and Anita because some other students have no clue what to expect as an engineer also. Uh, number two is uh, network with uh, professional engineers. So once or twice a month, we will go to all these cool meetings where would, uh, we would meet up with professional engineers. Um, but unfortunately, because of the COVID, we can't do that right now. Um, number three is to find a great advisor. And um, luckily, we have a great advisor like Professor Macarella, um, who's always uh, staying on top of everything and coming up with projects for us to do, especially in school. Um, number four is to participate on fun projects. And number five um, is to remember to have fun. That's all I have. <laughs> Thank you. Does anybody like to ask any questions now? Are we doing anything in the chat? Bob Richard Grubb wanted to uh, say something, I think. You're muted, Richard. Try that again, Richard. Take yourself off mute. There you go. I've done that so many times at his other conference I was at. That's, uh, just talking to myself, right? Um, no, I, mean, I, I went to community college too, like Chris did, and it, it's great. I mean, there's so many different types of people there. It's really, a, it's really a, um, it's really a, it's actually it's a worthwhile exercise to me to to to, to, do, to take that, get that two year degree. And I think you know, joining something like Ash is um, you know, it's a big deal for some of these students who don't necessarily or, or, or already have that self confidence. So what I've seen, you know. Uh, particularly at Mercer County, is the development and growth of these people that have joined the ASHI student chapter. And it's particularly important in two-year schools for the professor to be really active in the student chapter and making sure that, you know, it's still viable and still sustainable. And I said it, you know, I've said it a hundred different times, but I know Anita and Bundy would agree that, you know, Jim has done such a great job. And I've, we've reached out, the education committee has reached out to other community colleges in New Jersey that have engineering, civil engineering programs. And it's like pulling teeth to try and get these people to get back to us. And, uh, and you can see that in a way uh, by the attendance at, at this. I mean, we've, we've sent out three notices and uh, I think maybe Rowan at Gloucester are the only, only uh, other community college to actually uh, register for this. So I can just, you know, once again, I can just say, it's just incredible, I think, what you, what you guys at Mercer have done. And to think that you've done this now two years in a row, and I think everyone would agree this was a successful uh, meeting uh, today. I, I, uh, kudos, for, kudos to all you guys, Anita, Bundy, and, uh, and, and Jim, of course. So thank you. Yeah. Richard, if I may, I'd like to add to that. Um, uh, both, both sections of ASH in New Jersey, um, we have basically every month, we have presentations on different projects. I mentioned that earlier, but to the students, uh, a lot of attendance is free. And even membership in both sections is a reduced rate, but uh, some of these presentations are very informative. And even though we're into, um, you know, the non-face-to-face uh, -face type situation due to the virus, uh, we are using Remo platform. I don't know if some of you are familiar with it, but it does in fact allow for networking for one hour in the beginning where you could actually move around the room to tables. You could see who's at sitting at the tables. Um, professionals, you could sit and chat with them as if you were uh, face to face. So um, maybe working with uh, Richard Grubb, he'll let you know of, of our upcoming events, both for South and North Central about the presentations of different projects. And other than learning about the projects and getting some hands-on experience uh, with that, you could still chat with a lot of the professionals that you may be working with someday, and maybe firms that you'll be working with someday. So the Remo platform we're gonna use, it seems to work so far well. And um, don't be afraid that because we can't see face to face or you can't be there, that's an opportunity for you. But uh, follow the sites, the websites for the upcoming events. Uh, uh, reach out to Richard on that too. 
and myself and uh, certainly participate in our uh, meetings coming up. Um, right now, both South and North are working on the next six month, uh, six months to get some great projects on board so everybody can learn and listen. And, um, and I just want to offer that out to all of you. I know we're, we're, we're running just a little bit over, and, uh, but if I could just take just a moment. I'm, I'm Matt Carter. I'm the uh, chairman of the uh, Ash National Student Chapter Committee, and I just wanted to, uh, you know, say that there's uh, any of a number of uh, our committee members represented here on the call. I'll, I'll probably overlook some of them, but uh, Roger, our, our board liaison with the national board. We've got uh, Carrie and John and uh, I think uh, I think Gene Cipriani's still on the call. I'm not sure. Richard Grubb, uh, Aaron Muck. Um, uh, I'll I'll probably overlook some others, but uh, uh, quite a few of the committee are on the call. And my point in saying that is we're we're a, we're a large committee, um, very very active, and uh, we have a best management practices guideline on the Ash National website, uh, which any of you that are thinking about um, uh, starting uh, a, a student chapter, or if you're uh, if you're sort of in the process of that, or have started one, we really do think uh, sort of a pride of ownership or authorship. But we really do think it's a great resource. It answers a lot of questions that people have, and have been built off of the experiences of several student chapters. So we really, really encourage you to look at that, um, and we just really applaud the the, the students who are involved uh, and and interested in. Um, in the American Society of Highway Engineers, and we're glad you're involved with us. And um, you know, we this is the fourth uh, student chapter conference. It, we had the first one at the University of Delaware. Uh, Anthony uh, Gasparini's on the call. He was at the first one there uh, as a member of our student chapter there. We then went to Widener. Uh, then we had a, a, a great one last year at, at another great one uh, at Mercer in person uh, with a lot of very enthusiastic students. And we've had another great one here. So. Uh, I could go on and on as I normally do, and, and but I'll stop it there. I just, I, I want to applaud all of you that were here. I want to applaud Anita and Bundy and Jim for the great job that was done. Um, thank you all so much. I don't know whether you guys have any closing comments to, to send us out. I just wanted to, to actually thank you guys. Um, it's funny, you say that a lot of uh, colleges don't get back to you. Um, We've never experienced that with Ash. You guys have been fantastic. Um, Richard, and in moment's notice, will come in and speak to our students. I just hate it because it's so hard to follow him when then I got to teach a statics class after he gives a great talk. But we really do appreciate all, all the help that you guys did. Years ago, I was on the executive committee of Ash, and so I was on that side of the fence, and I, my goal is to bring it into education, so hopefully it'll continue. I've got, I've got to become an engineer though, right? Obviously, I need to get my PE. So I'll have to work on that, guys. I'm, I'm always in battles, you know, I can't get away from uh, uh, the Alamo. Uh, Jim, I have a question for you. Are the students actually in class or are they still doing a lot of it remotely online? So this semester, it's all remote, except that they're taking chemistry classes, the uh, lab portion, they do go online for that. But all the engineering stuff we, pre-record, you know, solve problems, and then we meet live as needed to, uh, to help. I think Jared, if he's still online, you were saying, Jared, you have a live class where you use a tablet to solve problems, right? Yeah, yes, I do Mondays and Wednesday nights. So on Mondays, I, uh, it's a, a recorded lecture. And then on Wednesdays, I do a live session. And uh, with my laptop also as a tablet, and I can write on the screen, so I actually, try to do a live instruction every Wednesday and I'm able to work out problems, you know, on kind of a digital whiteboard and it's, it's pretty cool. I, I did want to also just jump in and add that uh, Carrie reminded me that I forgot to point out um, the, the cost uh, for entry as a student in a national student chapter is exceedingly low. The national board a few years ago agreed to drop uh, uh, the, uh, the cost for students um, and so, you know, it's, it's something that you can participate in for free. Um, it's a great experience. So thanks, Carrie, for reminding me of that. I would like to thank all the ASH members for supporting us students at Mercer County College too. So, uh, and I appreciate you guys being on here as well as all the students, young students that are there. Thank you.
I want to just say hi to Sean Nickel. Hi, Sean. We've talked a lot over the phone and emails. And I'm sorry the, uh, the Riley thing didn't work out. It's okay, Rich. Uh, thanks for having us. I, it's really a great presentation. I really appreciate it. I need a story. I feel like um, that's actually, you know, we've had a lot of common experiences kind of adapting to how to um, continue chapter operations the past year. So I um, really enjoyed the presentation and uh, thanks, thanks for having us. You're welcome. All righty. Yeah, almost in a minute. Well, Anita and Bundy, or, uh, or, or wrap us up, I guess. Okay, so... Um, Thank you guys so much for listening to us. <laughs> okay, so how do we say goodbye? <laughs> we just say goodbye. We're, we're recording this, Bye. and we'll circulate the recording around. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you all. Great job, everyone. Great yeah. job. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice night. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night.